from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. Here's what's coming up. K-State's Sarah Lancaster will discuss selection and use of adjuvant products as additives to herbicides. Looking at the various functions that adjuvants perform in improving weed control, she's advising you producers to ask plenty of questions about the effectiveness of a given adjuvant before investing in it this growing season. Also from the Kansas Farm Management Association here at K-State, Chelsea Plummer and Tressy Mitzner will offer recommendations to you producers about farm and ranch record keeping. That was the subject of the latest edition of a new KFMA podcast series for you producers. And later, this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Dennis Patton on raised bed gardening. All that here on Agriculture Today. Thanks for tuning in once more to another Agriculture Today. Across the way, Sarah Lancaster, Weed Management Specialist, K-State Research and Extension. Primarily, we've invited her over today to take a look at the use of adjuvants as a complement to herbicide treatments to heighten the effectiveness of those treatments. Before we do that, though, there was fresh news breaking this week, Sarah, of interest to Certain soybean and cotton producers in designated counties in Kansas having to do with the enlist system. Tell us about what's going on. That's right, Eric. One of the big question marks that farmers in those 10 counties um, in southeast Kansas had this winter was, will they be able to use Enlist 1 and Enlist Duo in their traded cotton and soybeans? And for a long time, the answer was, we really don't know. But the EPA did announce that they have amended the labels that were approved in January to permit use of Enlist 1 and Enlist Duo in counties that had been labeled off for concerns about the American burying beetle. Um, So those 10 counties in Kansas are now able to use Enlist 1 and Enlist Duo. So I know that that is going to reduce one of many stresses that farmers are feeling this this spring. So so glad to be able to share that. Those producers who are wanting to commit to that system but weren't sure about the availability of the treatment, now they can move forward with those plans. That's right. We had been helping farmers to develop their kind of fallback plans but weren't sure when they needed to pull the trigger on them, so to speak. So we're glad to say they don't have to use those fallback plans. Very good. Good news indeed. But principally today, adjuvant products. What they're for. Let's get back to the basics here. Yeah, back to basics. So adjuvants are products that can alter the functionality, the performance of a herbicide spray mix. So, um, you know, they can do a couple of things. They can either improve the efficacy of the product or they can just make the spray mix kind of easier or better to use. So, you know, the first we call activator adjuvants, and those are things like non-ionic surfactants and crop oils. Um, the second we call utility adjuvants. And so those are things like drift retardants, foam markers even actually fall into that category. So a couple of different types of categories. The one that we usually put most of our focus on, though, is those activator adjuvants. Mm-hmm. So they can go beyond just keeping the product in place. They can serve a greater purpose than that. Absolutely. Absolutely. They are critical for some herbicides. And that's where, I don't know, have I done an interview with you, Eric, yet where I didn't remind farmers that they need to read the label? (laughs) (laughs) It's a standard theme, (laughs) but an important one. But yeah, it, it is. The label will tell you if an adjuvant is required and which adjuvants are options for any given product. We're talking about this in part today because there's so much focus on input costs right now, and we know the price of herbicides has gone skyward. How much adjuvants can help, and moreover, what products to select, and for what reason here? Yeah, so I think that's something to remember, Eric. One of the themes that we see is that when commodity prices go high, the pressure that farmers feel to buy some of these additional products goes up. 
And when herbicide prices go high, there's a temptation to try to use a lower cost adjuvant to sort of replace a herbicide. And that is a bad idea. Okay, we need adjuvants to maximize herbicide effectiveness, but an adjuvant does not kill a weed by itself. So you cannot replace a portion of a dose of a herbicide with an adjuvant. Then with that in mind, what are the guidelines for selecting product that you would endorse? And this could go quite some distance, one would think here. It is. And adjuvants are a difficult subject to talk about, to be honest, Eric, because there are so many options. And many of them are very, very good options. One of the things that farmers might need to think about when they're looking at adjuvant options is that adjuvants are not regulated the way herbicides are. You and I could start an adjuvant company, Eric, tomorrow and sell adjuvants to farmers. They're not registered the way that herbicides are. And so I would encourage folks to look for and to ask for data and evidence that a product does what the salesperson says that it's going to do. Making sure that you're looking for data over multiple years and multiple locations that says that this product does actually enhance performance of a herbicide. This may seem simplistic, but it's important here, though, that producers need to have an idea of what they really are trying to accomplish with an adjuvant. Select on that basis, right? Yeah, absolutely, Eric. So like I said, you know, it's going to be outlined in the label, but basically those adjuvants are doing... One of really several things for our spray mix, they might be solubilizing the cuticle of the plant. And so, you know, herbicides are applied in water. Plant cuticles and the surface of our weeds are primarily waxes or oils, basically. We all know the cliche that oil and water don't mix, right? And so one of the things that some adjuvants can do is to help that water-based herbicide interact with that waxy plant surface so that the herbicide actually gets into the plant. So those are typically, that's a function we think of for our crop oils or maybe our uh, methylated seed oils, um, is, is that solubilizing the cuticle. And so, you know, those products a lot of times need to be used at higher rates maybe or used instead of some other adjuvants um, when we have weeds that are really hardened off by drought. Um, So that would be a a situation there where you would want to look for those. But I'm going to say it again, double check your herbicide label to make sure that they are permitted for use um, with your product. If one's goals, on the other hand, would be, in fact, to be sure that that product stays put, you need to look another direction as far as an adjuvant? Absolutely. So some other things that adjuvants can do is, you know, sometimes we call them stickers, Some adjuvants will actually help the droplets spread out on the leaf. They break the surface tension. And a lot of times that's what our surfactants are doing, our non-ionic surfactants, is helping to break that surface tension. Adjuvants like AMS can help the actual herbicide molecule to stay hydrated so that it can get through the leaf. So there's a variety of functions going on there. I mean, it depends on the chemistry of that actual herbicide molecule and how it's going to interact with the leaf. It also depends on other things that are already in the formulation, hence the reminder to check the label. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, you talk about making herbicides stay put, especially with our extend-based systems. You know, we need to make sure that folks are looking at making sure they're using the volatility reduction agent, the drift reduction agent, as well as the other necessary adjuvants for the tank mix. So, you know, farmers that are using those systems know they're fairly complex um, in terms of all the requirements to try to prevent that off-target movement. Given that the labels are pretty tight, does a producer need to worry whatsoever about crop injury in adjuvant selection? Yeah, that can play a role, Eric. You know, one of the things you have to balance with everything herbicide-related is weed control versus crop injury, right? There's only so much distance between the genetics of a weed and the genetics of a crop. 
Um, and so that balance between weed control and crop safety is always a concern. And so adjuvants can play into that, right? As we kind of heat up our spray mix with adjuvants, we can also increase the possibility of crop injury. And so, again, you know, double checking that label. Anytime you're using kind of nitrogen based adjuvants, particularly, you know, sometimes UAN is used as an adjuvant in a spray mix. That is going to increase crop injury. Crop oils are going to increase crop injury. Methylated seed oils are going to increase crop injury more so than crop oils in general. So just being aware of those options and how your crop might respond based on environmental conditions. And a last thought here about product management, assuring that you're maximizing your efficacy with your adjuvant paired with that herbicide. Any things to think about there, Sarah? Yeah, you know, one of the other things that makes working with adjuvants a little bit difficult is that there are so many possibilities of things that can go into a tank mix, right, when you're spraying herbicides. And adjuvants are one of those things, and sometimes different types of adjuvants are going to, you know, sort of play better with different herbicide combinations than others. And so I would really encourage farmers to think about doing what we call a jar test for compatibility You know, basically a jar test is just taking a a small container and using the same ratio of your spray water to whatever your mix is going to be, your herbicides and your adjuvants, paying attention to mixing order, right? Some adjuvants need to go in before herbicides, some adjuvants go in after, and then agitating that, that small mix and seeing if things separate out, if you get that awesome, you know, kind of shaving cream consistency that we sometimes get, Um, just all of those things that can happen when we start to do chemistry experiments (laughs) with our herbicide tank mixes. Tara, thanks for covering all of this with us. Thanks, Eric. Weed management specialist with K-State Research and Extension, Sarah Lancaster. Some of the ins and outs of adjuvant selection and management to augment your herbicide treatments come cropping season time. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Up for a look on this part of Agriculture Today, a familiar aspect of farm and ranch management that most producers would consider mundane, but absolutely essential. Financial bookkeeping. If you didn't know, the Kansas Farm Management Association out of Kansas State University is now putting out a regular podcast for you producers and others to take in. It covers a wide array of management subjects, and the most recent of these podcasts walked through several ideas on economic record keeping worthy of a producer's consideration. Here's an excerpt from that podcast conversation featuring KFMA economists Chelsea Plummer and Tressie Mitzner. Chelsea starts it off. In talking about record keeping, there's a lot of types of records we need to think about. Um, So if you just approached a member and were wanting to talk about record keeping, what all items are you thinking about or discussing with you? Okay. Um, There's a few different things I, I think of in terms of financial records, such as your income and expenses, you know, your general financial transactions. That's um, one type of record that we should be keeping. Um, Another type of record is your assets and your liabilities. Uh, Any transactions of land, uh, machinery and equipment, any loan type records, you need to be making sure that you keep those in more of a longer term record keeping place. Then there's also the records that you need to keep for the analysis of your business and keeping track of the state of your business, such as your crop production, whether that's from um, insurance documentation or or yield verifications from the elevator cattle numbers, whether um, you're keeping track of the number that's in your cow herd at the beginning of the year and your cow losses and calves born throughout the year, sales tickets throughout the year, so you can have accounting of what those entities within your business are really doing and make sure that you can grasp the production side of things. Do you think there's certain areas that either they get neglected most or that maybe people don't realize are important? I guess something I've come across just here lately is not keeping track of the assets quite properly. It seems like 
when people are going to sell land in a, as a second generation, they don't have any of the documents of when the land was first purchased and what the basis is in that land or had a piece of equipment for 15 or 20 years, but they don't really know what the original value was of it. So if we're trying to split off a header from a combine, they're just selling the header. You really need those original documents to know what the value is of each piece of that equipment um, when you're selling it off the depreciation schedule. Um, so you can get the, the capital gains correct on that. So I think when we talk about keeping track of these different records, the asset purchase side of things needs to be kept in a location that you keep until you dispose of the asset, uh, whether that's the land or whether that's a piece of machinery and equipment or your cattle purchases, I guess, in a way, even you need to keep track of those. So those are readily available when you go to try to find <laughs> multiple years down the road or in a second generation. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned, you know, like assets for depreciation and when we purchase those and keeping those as long as we have the asset. And that was something I noticed uh, that it talked about. Uh, and that one of the things I wanted to reference today anyways, um, publication 225. Um, it's an IRS publication. It's the uh, Farmer's Tax Guide. I'm going to include a link to Pub 225 in the show notes. And it just has, and I think Trusty pointed out that maybe I didn't even realize there was this good section that talks about record keeping and talks about and the importance, and that was where I noticed when it talked about the assets for depreciation and making sure you keep them that long, and just a lot of beneficial information that I think could be very helpful to farmers out there, kind of having some of these questions, I guess, about record keeping. Yeah, and there's a few things that I kind of learned even myself as I was digging in and trying to find some answers for some producers that were asking, how long do I keep these, and how do I keep my records? And a couple of things I'll just point out. Um, in addition to keeping your I mean, expenses, you really need to keep the supporting documents, the invoices, the receipts, the purchases, sales, payroll, um, those business transactions. Um, we just had a pretty intense audit for one of our producers and kept all of that stuff. They had them organized by year, so we just pull out that year and send that in for the audit, and it was great that they had kept that. Um, they kept theirs by month. Some people choose to keep their, they'll go through the chart of accounts in QuickBooks and they'll make a hanging file folder for each account code. You know, they'll have their seed in one for the year and their chemical in one for the whole year. So, yeah. You know, you have to find a style that fits your operation. And for them, it was, okay, everything that I pay in the month of January goes in the folder for January. Um, other people like us personally, I, I like to be able to find, okay, if I have a part that I need to return, I can go to my parts folder because there's no way in the world I'm going to remember what month that I purchased. <laughs> I can at least dig through the parts yeah. file at my yeah. house. When I'm trying to do more of the analysis thing, I like to be able to see the sales, you know, pull my sales tickets out and find my weights if I'd forgotten to enter those into QuickBooks. So um, to me, it's easier to have each expense item have its own folder and each income item have its own folder in, in our filing system. And I have those in what I'd call our annual drawer. And then I have like a long-term drawer where I keep my loans, our assets, all the type of longer-term contract type things. My landlord contracts go in like the long drawer that we have. And that just kind of helps us keep our pieces and parts collected. So whatever works for you is the best. Get something simple and get it started. Some producers that throw everything in a briefcase and bring it to us in a briefcase, but at least they have everything that they need in a briefcase that they can dig out. They come in all ways, shapes, and forms, and, and everybody makes it work. I was just curious, though, if you want to even maybe expand on just some of the benefits of good record keeping you guys have seen or experienced. Oh, I think it's imperative to, if you are wanting to move your business forward, you have to know, you can't measure what you, what you don't know, whether it's on the financial side to just throughout the year, know where your business stands. If you're only getting a big picture annually, that's better than nothing. We are more on a, we try to make sure that we're on track quarterly with where we are, um, with our PL from our cash flow that we set. We're, you know, we're kind of working 
two years ahead, we've already set our cash flow for 2023. Um, and we set our, you know, cash flow for 2022 back in 2020. And so we're always comparing where, what our goals have been to where we are. And then I have some users that they get their P&L monthly. We send them out our KFMA um, staff enters their transactions and sends them a profit and loss statement every single month. So they're getting their eyes on their P&L every month. And I think if you're not getting your eyes on how your business is doing financially, you're not using all of the tools that you have to really move your business forward. You know, I see a lot that it seems like they're always kind of playing from behind. They're always trying to get caught up. And I think sometimes if they could you know, take that, that one day or take that one afternoon to just get a system started and kind of get through, get over that hump, get over that curve. And then just start one good habit, you know, yeah, you know, just yeah. one good habit of, okay, we're going to sit down, you know, it's only, we're only into March. So if you can get your filing system set up or um, instead of setting down every quarter or when it gets to the end of the year and entering all of your transactions in QuickBook, trying to maybe set aside just a little bit of time and, and do just a little dab of entering QuickBooks um, versus letting it get to be a mountain and, and overwhelming. I don't think I shared how long we should keep records. I might mention generally you need to keep um, records for at least three years um, from when you file your tax return or when your tax return was due or um, at least for two years after you've paid your taxes. So if you're filing late, you would need to keep it two years after you paid those taxes. So that means the supporting documents that back up those tax returns, all like your 1099s and your W-2s and all the income and expense receipts. If you have employees, you need to keep your employment tax records for at least four years from after the date the tax was due or is paid, whichever is later. So keep in mind four years on your employment records. And then once again, on the assets, really you need to have your assets, your asset purchases in, a, you know, a file that is like a long-term file because you should keep those records really until after you've disposed of the asset. So you don't want those in your, oh, I purchased a tractor this year. I'm going to keep those in my annual file and destroy those within three years because that tractor purchase needs to be kept until you sell the tractor or, you know, in the land, your land um, purchases and documents probably need to go in some type of safe deposit box or something longer term. You need to keep records relating to the basis of the property longer than that period of limitations. From the Kansas Farm Management Association, Chelsea Plummer and Tressie Mitzner. You can listen to this and all of the previous episodes of the KFMA podcast by going to the Kansas Farm Management Association website, agmanager.info slash KFMA, and click on the podcasts link on the left-hand side of that page, agmanager.info slash KFMA. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Agriculture Today continues with our weekly horticulture segment for you now, and we're in touch once more with Dennis Patton. Dennis is the Johnson County Extension Horticulture Agent. He was along with us last time out to take a look at container gardening, but this time, Dennis, another approach is in the spotlight here, and that would be raised bed gardening. And let's start very basically. What is meant by a raised bed garden? Well, great, great question. So a raised bed basically means you have an elevated growing container, almost like a container garden. Uh, the typical raised bed is like eight feet long, four feet wide, and usually somewhere six to ten inches high. And the advantages of a raised bed are much that to the container than you can bring in a quality soil mix uh, that helps break down our heavy clay soil. So a lot of these mixes are maybe half top soil, half compost, organic matter. And of course, you spade up, till up the existing soil, and then you bring a little bit of soil in. So now you're creating this really nice rooting profile that gives you good root development. Uh, and the other thing about a, a raised bed is when you're kind of containing everything in that small space, 
you're using every square inch. So you're not having rows between plants where you have a lot of weed growth or you're going to be watering where it's, you know, no, no plants growing. And so it's to me just this what we call intensive planting method and hopefully gives you more production kind of per square foot of, of garden area and garden a lot in a smaller space. You mentioned the dimensions of a raised bed. At least those are recommendations. As far as containing that bed, you can hold that together with railroad ties or whatever might work? Right. You know, uh, railroad ties. I've seen uh, cinder blocks. I've seen landscape blocks. You know, you can buy like two by 10 lumber. And, and the reason for the four foot width is because then you can reach about two feet into the bed from each side. So you're not getting into the the raised bed. You're not compressing the soil by stepping on it, walking on it. So you can conveniently, you know, kind of stoop, kneel on each side and then garden. So that's why I see that that four foot uh, width. The length can be whatever you want to fit the space, but usually we, we keep them that four foot wide. And this is ideal when you think of certain vegetables like vining crops, cucumbers, for instance. Strawberries often are grown on raised beds likewise, but the access to the product itself, as you say, is really so much easier. Right. And you bring up a good point. You're right. A lot of those vine crops, instead of letting them sprawl all over the ground, you can put a trellis in there, you can cage them like tomatoes. And then you've got that, you know, growing vertically, and then you still have that space at the base of the garden. And of course, the good gardening practices, you know, planting spring, summer, fall crops come into play too. You know, so this time of year, you'd be planting the the lettuce, the radishes, you know, the beets, the carrots, those type of things. And then you can save small spaces here and there to pop that tomato plant in come mid-May. And so once the lettuce is out of harvest, then the tomato plant takes up that space. As it might differ from container gardening, does one worry about drainage very much and overwatering plants here as you might with containers? You know, not as much. No, obviously with a raised bed, you don't want to locate it in the swampy part of your yard. You want to, you know, rough spade it, till it up, work some of that nice improved soil in there. So if your container raised bed six inches high and you, you know, spaded another six inches below in that existing soil and brought some mix in, now you have like this 10, 12 inch rooting depth that's going to get you really nice root development. So here again, it's all about planning ahead uh, for the crops you want to grow and, and really compacting that space in there and that intensive method in, in raised bed garden. All right. Dennis, we appreciate the word. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Dennis Patton, our guest for this week's horticulture segment, Johnson County Extension Horticulture Agent. And we do want to slip in a quick word here about that next K-State Garden Hour webinar. It is set to go this coming Wednesday April the 6th, over the noon hour. And the chosen topic this time is selecting and including plants in your home landscape setting to attract and support pollinators. Presenting is Central Kansas District Extension Horticulture Agent Jason Graves. These are great programs you do need to register, and to do so simply search for K-State Garden Hour and follow the prompts there. And with that, our time's away for today. Thanks for tuning in. Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today. This is the K-State Radio Network.